Church Adult Program that we're going to have every second Saturday of the month. <coughs> and I thought history would be a good draw, and I think it has been. And I'm glad to have Rod with us. So I'll just let him take over. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm the, I'm the first, I guess. So <laughs> that's, I don't know if that's good or bad. Good or bad is good. I mean, it's Rod Stanley. And uh, as I was telling some people that uh, I'm a retired school teacher, I taught for 35 years. My last 17 years, I was at Panorama in Panora. Uh, after I retired, I was telling the folks beforehand, I worked at Walmart for one year. And, you know, you can hear, say all you want about Walmart and how they treat their workers and this and that, but I worked in the Jordan Creek store when they first opened up. And actually, I really liked it because I got to deal with people. And I was working in the lawn and garden, which I love. I have a huge garden in my house and so on. But, in, but anyway, long story short, I, I enjoyed it. But then there was another job that opened up, and it was at Forest Park in Perry. And I don't know if you guys have been to Forest Park. If you haven't, you need to go over there because it's an excellent local museum. And uh, I've got a friend over there that's a curator. His name is Pete Malmberg. He does a great job over there at, uh, at Forest Park. But anyway, I got this job as a museum assistant, which was a part-time job. And it was there where I started doing lots of research. I started doing programs, adult programs, and uh, started researching subjects that, that I was interested in. I grew up in Dexter, so I'm a Dallas County boy. My mother still lives in Dexter. Uh, so I was interested in Dallas County, got that job, and so I started researching, started doing programs. You know, my last year there, I, I'd still be there, but you know, your Board of Supervisors uh, cut $365,000 out of the conservation budget. And not that I make $365,000 as a part-timer over there, but they decided my $13,000 job was not worth having anymore. And, you know, my last year there, I did 120 adult programs for them and uh, got a lot of people to come to the museum. And I'm not patting myself on the back, I love doing it. And I love talking about Dallas County history. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing about me. And one of the programs that, that, that people really like, and I don't know whether she'll ever have me here to do it, and maybe some of you have been in my program, but you know, the Bonnie and Clyde program, and the shootout at North at, at Dexville Park in 1933. Uh, there's a huge interest in Bonnie and Clyde. And, you know, we had, I, the museum in Dexter, we had over 600 people at the museum in Dexter last year, believe it or not. That's a lot for us. Um, but most of them came to learn about Bonnie and Clyde. You know, and there's, there's a fascination with those two outlaws. Don't ask me why. Maybe it's because they were male and female or whatever the case might be. But, you know, that's, that's one of the programs. And, you know, there's, there was other programs that, you know, I was interested to in find out about or other subjects in Dallas County. And like I was saying before, most of the time, if I was interested in a subject, I found that adults are interested as well. Other adults in Dallas County are interested in it. One of the, one of the programs, or one of the things that I became interested in was about the Interurban Railroad. And the Interurban uh, was a local railroad. It started, in, it started in Perry, or it started in Des Moines, whichever way you want to put it. Probably Des Moines to Perry would probably be better, because the guy that that started out with it was living in Des Moines. And the people in Perry jumped on board uh, with financial aid, and that's one of the reasons why it went to Perry, was because of that. But you know, the inner urbans, the inner urban was an electric railroad. And that, that's what made it fascinating me. And I, you know, I was reading articles in the, I've got some of these here, and you guys can look at these, and I just need to have one of them back. And I don't even know how I got started on this, I mean, as far as seeing it, but, but I started researching it then. And, you know, I don't know whether you realize at Forest Park we have hardbound copies of old newspapers. And it goes all the way back to like in the 1870s. And those things are falling apart. You've got to be really careful with them. But I, I started after I found out about the inner urban, when it was, I started looking in those newspapers. And yeah, you cut passes around and, and fi finding newspaper articles about the pro the progress and how it how it started and you know how it went from Des Moines and, and so on but uh, 
I don't know, it's an interesting story. The, the, the fact that it was a, an electric railroad, it wasn't steam powered, although they did build the tracks, they did build the tracks to con so that, that steam locomotives, and you know, and the freight the freight thing was important as far as the as as the inner urban was concerned. But I was just gonna you know give you a little background about inner urbans. You know, the definition of an inner urban is relating to or connecting urban areas. Inner rail or interurban railroads serve a smaller region, more frequent service, passenger service. That was the main thing about the establishment between Des Moines and Perry was was going to be the passenger train or it was going to be passengers. It's electrically powered. It's heavier and faster than streetcars. It used trolley wire, wires or pantographs. They're built with local financing and managed by local people, usually built to steam, steam engine standards. The first electric interurban was in New York City, connected Niagara Falls and Buffalo. Uh, the cars, I could never find what the specific size of the car was that ran between Des Moines and between Des Moines and Perry. Uh, so I looked up the car, and I'm, I'm assuming, and sometimes you know when you assume that's not good. Sometimes you do get kicked in the ass, you know, if you assume too much. Uh, but anyway, 53 feet long was the standard from what I looked up, and a width, uh, a width of a standard steam railway car. And they were powered by, I do know this, they were four engines on the cars, 75 horsepower each. The standard voltage was 600 volts direct current and power stations were built specifically for interurban trains. All the power that ran the interurban, that ran from Des Moines to Perry, originated in Des Moines. Originated in Des Moines. But they had, I think, two or three power stations between Des Moines and Perry. I know there was one in Perry, and I think there was two other, like they called them substations, where they would generate power. You guys probably know, you know, the longer you stretch wires out and electricity runs through it, it weakens as you go. So you had to have some type of booster to keep the power up so that you could make it all the way on your, on your trip to wherever it might be. There's a fellow that I got a lot of information from, a guy by the name of Ron Sims. And I don't know, probably you don't, I don't know, you probably don't know who I'm talking about. He lived in Des Moines. And he's an expert on the interurban, and I talked to Ron at length about the interurban between Perry and Perry and, and Des Moines. And he said that he he knew a fellow that used to be one of the fellows that drove the interurban car. And he said that at night, particularly, he said that they would get within like three or four miles of Perry, and he would have to stop. And they had phones, they had phone service on the poles, and they would have to stop and call the guy at the power station in Perry and say, "Crank her up." because I'm losing power, I'm not going to be able to make it unless you crank it up for me. And so they would, and then, they, of course, they'd make, you know, they'd make the, the, the final trip in. But, you know, they were 53 feet long, four engines of 75 horsepower. Now, at the same time that, uh, I want you to take a look up here, at the same time that, you know, the, the inner urban went in from Perry, you can't really see it all here, but you can see, get, get the gist of it. And you can see Des Moines, and you can see Perry, and you can see your own hometown of Woodward, because there was, in 1906, there was a line that went from, from Moran, which was a main junction. Moran was a new town that developed. There are a number of new towns that developed along the interurban route between the two when this thing was, was built. But you know, you can see that. But there was actually 11 other interurbans that were built at the same, about around the same time that that this interurban was built between Des Moines. Des Moines and Perry. They call it the Golden Age. You know, this was like 1906 is when the interurban was built between Des Moines and Perry. Okay? 1906. So there were these other interurbans that, you know, people were interested in as well. The longest one and the one that I've heard a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people about, was the one for, uh, that went from Des Moines to Boone up to Rockwell City, all the way up to Fort Dodge. The Des Moines Fort Dodge is what it was called. I have talked to many people that rode that. I have talked to many people that rode, you, and you know where I talked to them at? In assisted living homes, in nursing homes. You, you'd be amazed how many people in those assisted living and the nursing homes, they love to see me come and give a program about history. And it was great for me too, 
because those people knew more about it than I did. They, they'd tell me, they'd educate me. I love that. I mean, I like it when somebody says, yeah, hey, Rod, I, I rode that train. I remember riding on that train from Perry to Des Moines to go to the, go to the downtown business district. You know, that, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I'm not offended. They know more than I do. Anybody time you can talk to somebody that, that's experienced history, you better talk to them while they're still around. Because, you know, when they die, that, that's, those stories are gone. It's not going to be there anymore. But you know, that Boone, from Des Moines to Boone to up to northern Iowa, that was the longest route in Iowa. And there were a lot of people. That was probably the, the most important one at that, that particular time. But you know, there were 11 other interurbans that were, were built at this time. And again, to provide passenger service and to provide freight service at night when the interurban, when the passenger trains would, didn't run. Because, you know, the one between Perry and, Perry and Des Moines, the last, the last one was like at 11 o'clock at night. That was the last run of it. Then after that, then the freight trains, the freight train would run between Des Moines and Perry. Because the track was built to support that much weight and so on. And there were some cases where that, you know, they, they didn't do that. But um, there's one electric railroad. I, can't see it on this map, but it's up in northern Iowa near Mason City. And it's called, uh, I can never remember the name, the Central I or the Iowa Traction Railroad Company. And they still use electric engines. It's a 10 mile track. It's not passenger, but they run freight and so on on it. It's not a passenger train. I don't know if anywhere in Iowa where they run a passenger train on that. You know, the, uh, in, in Des Moines, and it, there's nobody in this room that can remember it. Maybe you can remember going to Des Moines. I can remember going to Des Moines with my brother and my mom going to my great grandfather's house that was on some street in Des Moines, and we'd stand out in the front yard, and there was a there was a, a streetcar that went by. This was in the '50s, and I can remember us standing there and hearing this rumbling sound coming up the street, you know, and seeing this this car coming up. We weren't so much interested in the car; we were interested in the damn sparks flying <laughs> flying off the line, saying, "What is this monster?" coming here and it roar by, it wouldn't stop, it roar by, and you know, we were just fascinated with that. But this was like in the 50s, and when they were still running at that particular time. It wasn't much after that, I think they closed down. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't profitable to be able to, to, to run those. But, you know, there is one place, uh, and this kind of gives you an idea of how, how those interurbans were. But anyway, you know, the city of Perry, you know, when talking about Perry was known for its railroads, and I don't know how many of you guys live in this area, you probably know that. There were three, there were you know, the Milwaukee, and then it was what, the Minneapolis, uh, St. Yeah, you know. the, 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 I mean, it was, a, it was a big railroad. It came up from the, from the south, and the Milwaukee was more of an east and west type of thing. And, and of course, uh, a, a lot of people worked in the railroads in Perry. Um, I can remember coming to Perry, I never rode the train, but I brought people up to ride the train in the, in the 60s to Perry. So, you know, it was, it was a main station, a main, a main place. And um, the people in Perry were interested, they were interested in maybe having another line there. And there was a fellow in Des Moines who was in charge of all the streetcars. And you can look him up. I just read an article about him the other day on Facebook, and I don't even know why it, it, why it popped up, but his name was Jefferson Polk. And Jefferson Polk controlled all the streetcars in Des Moines, the electric, the electrical system. And he also uh, was interested in interurbans. In fact, you know, in 1902, prior to the interurban in coming to Perry, he built an interurban from Des Moines to Colfax. And it kind of ran, you guys familiar with the Rock Island? The Rock Island went through Dexter, run with, it was like 150 feet from my house, the tracks. You know, people say, how in the heck did you ever sleep? Once you got used to it, it's like, it was like music at night when it came through this train. You know, oh, yeah, the train's coming through, you know, relaxing. You know, the passenger trains, we used to love watching the passenger trains. But <clears throat> it, it ran as a competition, kind of with the Rock Island. But, you know, you know why he went to Colfax? Does anybody know what was in Colfax? Oh, I, I've got beginning history students here. <laughs> There's actually resorts there. 
Did you realize there was resorts in Colfax Island? They had mineral water there. People were fascinated with mineral water. Drink it. Oh, I feel that elbow that hurt don't hurt anymore. Yeah. Sit down in that tub. Had arthritis all over my body. God, I just feel I just feel great because of that. But anyway, he got the idea that, you know, let's transport people out there. And they actually, you know, they built two hotels in Colfax, Iowa. And at one time, before they went bankrupt, they had like 13,000 people. Not necessarily all from Des Moines. But people all over came to Colfax to soak in the mineral water. Now, we had one out at Dexter, at Dexfield Park. There was a spring out there, it's called Marshall Springs. In that amusement park, they used to fill up the pool with Marshall Springs. And then they would advertise it as such, you know, hey, come out here swimming. You're going to make you feel better. And we'll even bottle it up for you. We'll even crock it up. We'll put it in a crock and you can take it home, you can drink it, and it'll make you feel good there too. You know? And they did the same thing at Colfax. I mean, I've seen... and. They, the Colfax crockeries, those babies are expensive. I've never seen one from Dexfield Park. I'm not, I'm not saying they didn't exist, because the people wrote about that they, they actually did that. But anyway, Jefferson Polk built, in 1902, he built an interurban from Des Moines to Colfax. And with the idea, with the idea that eventually that it was going to go to Newton and points north and east. Of course, when he approached the Perry folks back in 1905 about building the interurban out there, the Perry folks, a fellow by the name of Patty, was really excited about that, and there were a lot of other businessmen that were excited about, you know, connecting Perry with Des Moines with an electric train and, and, and bringing it out there. So excited that they decided that, yeah, we'll put some money up on this. So and that's what Polk was looking for. Any, anybody that was willing to put money up, okay, we're, we'll make an effort to get out there to do that. So, you know, the people in Perry decided that that's what they wanted to, that's what they wanted to do, and that was one of the reasons why. Plus, the fact that, you know, Perry was already kind of set up for the railroad as well, because they already had two depots, the Milwaukee and the Minneapolis-St. Paul. They already had that already set up. And so they were a railroad town. You know, there's another program that I do. Right around this particular period of time, maybe 15 years before this, there was a town, there was a town that was northwest of Perry. It was border Boone, Boone, Boone and, and Green Counties called Angus. Anybody heard of Angus? Oh, you guys have? Good. And if I might, uh, if you get a chance to get up to Angus, stop and read that rock. There you go. Sixteen saloons. There you go. I mean, <laughs> there you go. Well, they said they used to be seven thousand population. There. I've heard that too. Uh -huh. Read. Oh, it's they, worth the trip today. Go read it. They, You'll be amazed. They, they had a, a peak population of eight thousand people. Yep. So you know, you're talking about you're talking about the Waukee of the late the late eighteen hundreds. I mean, Waukee has grown. You know, you you people are old enough. And I mean, dri driving through Waukee in the 60s, it's like, yeah. where is it? Where is it? And now, you know, they're building a second high school. I mean, there's that many people that are moving out there. But, you know, Angus was that kind of growth. And it was a coal mining place. It was a coal mining place. And you're right. The, the marker that's out there the, <laughs> that commemorates the 16 bars. I don't know there's a story that goes along. We're getting, we're getting off the subject here, which, which is fine with me. I mean, we'll get back to the urban here, but, but you know, Angus was uh, uh, a pretty wild place. I mean, those miners had to have something to do. I mean, there's nine, nine major mining companies there, but, you know, one of the stories that I read, there was actually, from the research I've done, there was only actually one bar in, in Angus. But anyway, there's a story that I read about the, the, the road, the, the, the bars, there were bars on both sides of the road, and that if, you know, one in Greene County and one in Boone County, it's like, <clears throat> okay, if I get in trouble over here, you know, I'll just go across the road. And I'm in, a, I'm in, I'm in the other county now, and I can thumb my nose at the sheriff over here. And, and when he leaves, then I'll go back to my, 
the bar that, you know, that are there on the other side of the road. That kind of thing. But Angus is a great story. That's a great program. I, lo I like doing that program. Uh, that might be one that you want to think about maybe doing because I, I haven't done that one in a while. But it's, it's, it's a fascinating story of about a boom place. I mean, it boomed and, and uh, there's a number of interesting stories that happened. But, you know, getting back here to the inner urban, but, you know, that so Jefferson Polk had some people in Perry that were interested in doing this. So they decided that they were going to, to do it. The first thing they had to do, though, was to survey this route and, you know, get, get the route established and where they were going to go. And I did read in one of those newspaper articles about <clears throat> the idea of if somebody didn't want to sell, they, they condemned the land. I thought that, I didn't know that a private enterprise could condemn land for, for, for that use, for public use. A private business. I thought if a, I mean, like if the state comes in and says, okay, yeah, we're going to build a state highway or a state railroad or whatever the case might be, yeah, we can condemn the land, we give you the price of the land. But there was actually some of that condemnation that did take place when they, they established this route. I, I don't know. I, I didn't realize you could do that, but I guess maybe you, I guess maybe you can. But How is that different from the eminent domain and the pipelines? It's, yeah. That, 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 it's, the same, it's the same deal, isn't it? It's the same, I never thought of that, but it, it is. It's the same deal. Private company... Good point. Good point. I never thought of that, but yeah. So evidently it was okay because they're still doing it today. You know, with that, with that, with that situation. But anyway, uh, so they eventually got their 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 route, and they started building them from Des Moines. And of course, the let's see if I can move this up. I normally have a slideshow of this computer. I don't know, it won't let me do it. There's a map. And it's too, it's, I've got some maps in there too, but all the, this route right here, and I don't know, you can see all those names on it. Those were all places that eventually developed along the, along the inner urban. Different names of different places, those were stops, okay? But, you know, they, they started from downtown Des Moines. They started from downtown Des Moines, and they worked their way northwest through Johnston, through Camp Dodge, to Granger. You know, Granger, uh, uh, I don't know what you know about the circus in Granger. Yeah? Or not? Mm -hmm. You guys oh, ever yeah. heard about the circus yeah. in Granger? Yeah. Them elephants are buried up there on the hill. So they say. Really? Yeah. So, so they say. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I wish we could find out if that was actually true or not. Well, I'll tell you, I restored a barn out there for a guy from Ohio. And I sat there and visited. He's 93. And I sat there one afternoon while my guys worked, and uh, he shared some stories with me. And he oh, says, I, when and the elephants, they weren't very nice to him either. Oh, no. When they got unchained, they went over to the barn and pushed them doors open. And they'd get in there and start eating that hay. And he says, and I was just a kid. He says, you didn't really push an elephant around. You know, you didn't tell him to get out of the barn. But uh, no, he, was, I, yeah. he was interesting. Yeah, I, I had heard that story. The, the, the Yankee Robinson Circus wintered in Granger. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because Dallas County had, I'm getting off the subject here, but it's all right with you, but I guess you don't have any choice. <laughs> you can't, can't be Unless you've got a dates or something going on. But, but anyway, Dallas County actually had two circuses. Mm -hmm. They had a circus that, that south of Dallas Center that winter, the Wharton Circus, which I do a program about Wharton Circus as well. Uh, and then I, we talked about the Yankee Robinson. But I, the reason I bring it up was because when the inner urban, and, and if you go on 141, on 141, if you're heading east, you're heading east, and you look, there's, to be on the north side of the road, and there's a big knob there, and that's supposedly where the elephants buried in that area. <coughs> but that's where that circus wintered. And, and the inner urban actually ran J Jefferson Polk, and, and I know why he did it. I know why he did it. But he had a, 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 
a section off the inner urban that went up into where they where they had the Windring headquarters. You know, Jefferson Pope was all about making money. You know, see. How can I make money off of this deal? Well, I have a, a wintering circus there with the elephants and with, you know, tigers and all these wild animals. So let's promote, let's promote in the springtime before they head out on their tour, let's let the people who want to in Des Moines get on these inner urban cars and let's ride out to see these animals and elephants and let's make a day of it. But it's going to cost you to go out there. I'm going to charge you to go out there. And that's what he did. And so they would go out there and they would look at people. Of course, how many times are you going to see an elephant? Or are you going to see a, a, a tiger? There's one story, though, I read about. There was a, a family that went out there and a, a little girl got too close to, I don't know whether it was a tiger cage or a jaguar cage, got too close to it and the jaguar or tiger just, just ripped, ripped her a good one. I mean, there was a story about it in the newspaper and so on. But he was going to make money on it because you're going to have to ride out and you got to pay. And then you're going to have to ride back and you're going to have to pay. So, you know, but they, there was uh, a route that went in it. But I was going to say, if you, when you're driving east on 141, you can see where the old interurban line is at. You can see it along the road. It's right there. It's still there. There's lots of trees and stuff growing up, but it's right there. That was the interurban that, uh, that we're talking about here on that. But anyway, so uh, they got to uh, the Granger pretty quickly. And if you read those newspaper articles, it's always talking about, you know, the work's going to be done. And, I mean, by July, the railroad was going to be in Perry and so on. I don't know. They ran into some difficulties, evidently, along the way. I mean, as far as, you know, getting the grade built and, 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 and that kind of thing. Uh, one of the problems they ran into, they got... They got to like two miles southeast of Perry. This was like in 1906. And they established a camp out there. And, you know, and most of the work was done by men, men and mules, from what I read, although they did say they had some steam powered, you know, contraptions to move dirt. What do they call it? You know, dirt. Uh, I can't even get, skip in my mind what the big thing that takes big chunks of dirt out quickly. What do they call it? I, you, neither can you. You're not telling. You're not telling. You're, not telling. you're, not telling. you're, a, you're supposed. You're supposed to tell me when I can't remember. Call them steam shovels. Thank you. <laughs> steam shovels. That's what happens when you get to be 68. You I mean, can't, can't remember a damn steam shovel. But 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 anyway, they they got to that point and they were using they were using Italian workers that they hired on. In the newspaper article, if you get if you find that, uh, they didn't call them Italians though. And this is not me saying this, because I have nothing against Italians. But they call them Dagos. These Dagos don't want to work. They want rubber boots to wear because their shoes get all muddy. We're not going to give them rubber boots. You're done. You're fired. So they hired a bunch of Swedes from Minnesota. They didn't care. They got their feet all muddy. They didn't care about rubber boots. That, but I thought it interesting, you know, and again, you, it's not right to use those kind of names, but they used it in the newspaper, in the Perry Chief. It's like, they don't want to work. Those Italians don't want to work. So, but they got to the point where they were like two miles uh, southeast. You know, when I was working at Forest Park, uh, the first few years I was there, there was a great big, great big uh, pile of dirt. And it went for like 25 or 30 feet. And when I first started working, I said, what, what's that? Why is that there? And it was actually the right-of-way of the inner, of the inner urban. It was the last right-of-way of the inner urban. I mean, there was no more. I mean, the inner urban came right through Forest Park and then on its way to, on its way to Perry. And it was there. My last year there, they decided that, that they wanted to take it out. And I remember going round and round with the conservation board and with the director and saying, you know, you take it out. I mean, we have no history here anymore. Yeah, but we need room to move our, pit, our trucks and back. We need room. So I lost out on that battle and they took it out. But I did win on the battle if you ever go to Forest Park. There's, the compromise was, okay, let's put a marker. 
And so I got two railroad tracks, the guy I got from Earlham, and put it the correct width. You know what the correct width was? You know what the width of the railroad track is? Boy, you guys in Woodward know. It's wrong. Four foot eight guys. inches. How much? Four foot eight inches. <laughs> That's this guy's on the ball back here. He's just being quiet. I think he knows more than what he's. I think he knows he, more than what he's showing. He worked for the railroad. Okay. <laughs> Suppo suppose, supposedly, supposedly the width of a Roman chariot. Did you know? Yeah. That? Yeah, yes. That, that's the reason why they did that. Except there was some narrow gauge stuff that they built, like that went through Panora and you know for Redfield and so on. It was a, I forget what's three foot something, but it was a, they called that narrow gauge. But 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 anyway, you know they. Uh, uh, Oh, the marker is what I was talking about. But anyway, we got the marker in the set, and, that, and then we have a, a, a thing there that, that I wrote up about the inner urban. So people are going to realize if you go up there and outside, there's a, there's a marker that, that at least remembers where the inner urban, where the inner urban was located as, as far as that goes. But anyway, so you know they got within two miles of Perry, and finally they, they, got, uh, they got the job done. They actually built a station. They built the inner urban station um, where the old Casey store was at in Perry. It was on, it was on West Willis. I think the police, there, there's a city building there now. It was on the other side of that city building. That's where the, the depot was. So, so now they had three depots, basically, for all three railroads. And, of course, Perry was a hopping place at that, that particular time. The grand opening came November 5th, 1906. It was a fabulous day for Perry. 600 people from Des Moines came on new train cars. Several prominent people. You guys heard of Henry Wallace? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, he's a very prominent Iowan. You know, he came, he come up and gave a speech and everybody was very optimistic. Three stations. The railroad was a great success. The cars ran at intervals of an hour and a half, starting at six o'clock in the morning. Okay? And it was doing the same way on the other end, too. Okay? So how do you avoid each other? Okay? Well, I'll show you here in a second if I can get it to come up. How they had wise, they called them, I think. And at, at the depot in Perry, they had where they could just go around, around it, okay? And, get, and come back. Again, in contact with electrical wires. And those round... Pantographs, I think they called them, that went along, along, along it. I think, from what I've read, maybe 35 or 40 miles an hour, top speed. It cost 75 cents one trip in, a buck 25 round trip from Des Moines to get in, to get back. I've gotten to talk to people <laughs> that rode this. First time I gave this program at a, one of the assisted livings, this little old lady, and I can't remember what her name was, says, oh, gosh, I, I can remember writing that. And she said, she said, we called it, we called it the Galloping Goose. I said, the Galloping Goose? I said, why? And she says, well, he said, when you rode on that train, he said, it went like this, and then it goes, up and down like this, she said, looked like a goose when a goose was running along. You know, if you've ever seen a goose, they go back and forth and up and down. She said, but we called it the galloping goose. I said, well, that's, that's pretty interesting stuff that you're talking about there. But she said they used to ride on it. They used to ride on it to go to Des Moines. It went to downtown Des Moines. There was a terminal at 6th and Mulberry. And then they established a permanent terminal at 2nd and Grand, I think. It's where that one was at in Des Moines where, the, where the, the, trains, where the trains went. But all those stops along the way, except if it was a special train. Now they did have special trains, and I'll talk about that in a second. All those places, or anywhere along the line, if somebody was there, they would stop and pick them up. That's the reason why you never knew how long it was going to take. Because if there were people standing there, they stopped and got them. Farmers started putting out fresh produce milk cans or cream cans with their markings on them to be taken into the dairy in Des Moines to be processed. They would leave them at these stops. 
and then they would return the cans back. They'd have to stop and drop them all off then on the, on the return trip back on that. Okay? But anyway, they started at 6 o'clock in the morning. They went until like 11 o'clock at night was the last time the train, or, or excuse me, it was a midnight. Cars would stop at any road crossing and pick up passengers. School teachers, college students used the trains a big deal. At State Fair, they would operate two cars together and ran special trains as needed. Freight train operated at night, and so on. In conjunction with the Perilina, a spur was made from the new town of Moran to Woodward. And I was telling your librarian on the phone, and you, uh, you guys are probably aware of this, it's not something that's probably not new to you, but that concession stand at your north of your football field, when I was still working at Forest Park, I stopped there and took some pictures of it, but that, that was the interurban stop. That was the station. It was right there. That's where the stop was at, where they would pick people. That's where they would pick people up. And I think it's still there. It was the last time I looked. You mean the, the building in the park? Itself? Yes. Yes. The building yes. In the park, yeah. Yes. The building in the park was where. Yeah. That, that was where the. That's where the station was at. And, and from what I read, that building is the building. <coughs> I mean, obviously kept up to date and so on, but that, that was the actual building that they used for uh, for that in that case. Was, was that for the in the, in the urban used that one? Right. So they had two in it. That wasn't the same one that went to Whitman to Perry. That, that was a different one. That's a, that, was, that was a separate railroad. You had another one that was on, that would have been the Milwaukee line. Then they stopped in, in Woodward to pick passengers up and so on. There would have been a separate depot for that, yes. That's like Perry. That's like Perry had one for the Minneapolis, one for the Milwaukee, one for the Interurban. They had three depots, and they said it was hectic as the devil because they had people at all three depots. Of course, they had the hotels and things, picking people up, taking people places. And so well, the one that went from Des Moines to Perry was a different route than from Woodard to, to Des Moines. What the Interurban? Uh huh. No. It, it, the, basically, the, the Woodward line thing was you had the main line from Des Moines to Perry, then it was a, a, like a spur that went into Woodward and then came back to get on the main line to go back to Des Moines. Oh, okay. I mean, it was more of a, a spur type of thing. Or like, a, I don't know if that's the right word for it or not. But I mean, it's actually a diverture or a departure from the, from the main line. So, okay. But anyway, a lot, of, a lot of different stops and things on there. Let's see if I can get something else up here for you. Well, so this rail bed between here and Woodward, where they're talking about putting the bike trail. That, that's Milwaukee. That's a Milwaukee. That's a Milwaukee. Milwaukee road. That was a Milwaukee. Okay. Right. But like I was saying, if you drive on 141 east past Granger, you can see where the old road bed was for the, for the interurban. Mm -hmm. for that. And it, it went from there. Uh, through Camp Dodge, and then Northwest Des Moines, and then into Des Moines. There's a locomotive that they used to haul supplies and things. That other picture below it would be when they were building it. Heavy equipment. So that, you know, they built it to the standards where they could run steam locomotives on there at night. There's one of the cars. Take a look at that for a second. I have some more in there. Here we go. Car 701. Now, that was actually a car that went to Colfax. There's a picture of downtown Des Moines. This will be right around the same time, like in the early 1900s. And electric street cars. You got you got three forms of transportation. If you can see it there in the picture, you got horse-drawn carriages. You got the electric train or electric street cars, and you have gasoline-powered automobiles. You see it all. That picture would be at Colfax, I believe. No, excuse me. Yeah, it would be at Colfax. That picture was at Perry. 
they haul freight in those in, in those cars as well. I mean, like I was saying, they they haul produce, but they they would haul other stuff as well. This would be the one line going this way. That was the Milwaukee line, and the interurban actually crossed. That would be well. Be on 140. Be on 141. I mean, it'd be like the bike trail. That's the Milwaukee line, and then 141. Evidently, 141. I don't know if 141 wasn't there then. I don't know when 141 was built, but you're talking where where that crossed. And maybe it didn't have to be there though. Milwaukee had a line that went south out yeah. of Madrid. Yeah, that had to cross the interurban somewhere. Yeah, that that might be it. Uh, right there in Granger. Yeah. Is that where it was? Yep. Yep. Because that's come up along the... No, Milwaukee didn't go through Granger, though. Well, what was the line that went down? That Hell, I rode that. We'd jump that when we was kids and yeah, ride it up yeah, to... Right. In Grimes, we'd ride it up to Granger. That's where it went, to Granger, out of Madrid. And that's it got on the other off. side of Granger. It started yeah. building steam, and it'd get up to where you yeah. just about got afraid to jump off. Yep, that's where it was. But Boy, you were ornery. <laughs> no. Bunch of us did. You, you were ordered. <laughs> but anyway, that it was, it was a big deal, though. Something. I mean, I don't know why it was a big deal, but where it crossed that junction or something. But then that I was talking about before how they avoided each other when there was, like I said, every every hour and a half there were there were trains coming from Perry and trains going to Perry, and you can see the why where they could divert each other and then get back on the main line. Did, did uh, both lines have electric power or was one steam? Uh, both, of them, both of them were electric. Well, then it would be a problem because the pantograph would have to be lowered. Well, good big. I had never thought about that. Hmm. I mean, to me it looks like that one track goes this way and it's got a wire that goes and then this other one. But you're right, I don't know. You might be right about that. That is crossing Beaver Creek. Is Beaver Creek that big now? Where would that be, Mike? I don't know. Probably over there by the Four Corners, huh? No. Could be. Well, it's where it crossed there. You know, no, there it could, is, could uh, be south of. Um, on Odessa, south of Leaming Ranch, because the right of way is yeah. still there just before it crosses there by Llewellyn. Sure, sure, yep. Didn't it, didn't the other yeah, urban go by that Dayton? Oh, yeah. That I, Dayton house? I remember. The other, the other thing about Beaver mm -hmm. Creek, mm -hmm. and again, this is this is Jefferson, this is Jefferson Polk, and maybe you guys have heard of this, but they actually were, I think they actually did it. They built a, a, a park where they dammed up. There was a, from what I read, there was a gravel pit or something out in that area, and where Beaver Creek was at. But they were going to put a dam on Beaver Creek and create a, a lake where where Jefferson Polk could again bring people from the city out to this park. Where they could bring their picnic lunches, where they could they had canoes and things that they could boats they could rent. There was places to walk around. I mean, to get out of the city, and I I think it actually happened. I you know I have found no evidence that it didn't because there's an article in one of those in the newspaper article where they were talking about the things that they were going to do on Beaver Creek, and again to make you know people come out here. You know Jefferson Polk. Like I was telling you, he was in charge of all the streetcars in Des Moines. Do you guys remember the Riverview Amusement Park? Absolutely. Built, built about the same time that Dexville was, the Dexville Park north of Dexter. But in the beginnings of that, that thing, before, before the, all the rides and things like that went in out there, Jefferson Polk made that a destination as well. Because that was kind of out on the edge of Des Moines at that time. And it's like, okay, we'll run, we'll run our streetcars out there. <coughs> Excuse me. And people can go out there and, again, spend the day in the country. But to get there, you're going to have to pay a fare. 
in order to get there. I mean, the guy was, the guy was, you know, he was in to make money, which I guess, you know, that was it. And like I said, the, you know, when this thing in Perry went in, one of the main reasons was that people in Perry could put money up to do it. But, you know, he was talking, Polk was talking about making Perry a terminal and then going north and west and then going, like, to Greenfield, Adel, Greenfield, south and west, going west, and kind of southwest, to Panora, he was talking. But the unfortunate thing, I think probably why, is because those towns weren't interested. Or evidently they weren't interested to put up money, to put up capital in order to, you know, to, to be able to do that. Um, I don't know where that picture is, I'm sure. So Rod, meanwhile, all of these <clears throat> other interurban lines right. were being run by other people. Right, or all others. over the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, they were just... Were they working together, or...? Mm -mm. It was all, like, private, I mean, privately, private businesses mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But, you know, like I said, there were 11 other ones that started about the same time as this one. So there was a great interest in this electric railroad thing, for some reason. I don't know why, for sure. Like electric power cheap? I, I mean, I, I don't know. But there seemed to be, that, that's the fascinating thing to me, a 600 volt system, I mean, as far as direct current. So the riders were, were there commuters going to work in yes. Des Moines? Yes, yep. There Is were people that would go to work, students that were attending schools in Des Moines, people that, uh, you know, just wanted to, exactly. to make the trip to Des Moines. It was cheap. I mean, people didn't have cars. 1712. Okay, this is 1714. And this is right outside of the Woodward people. Oh, this, is it? Yeah. I actually know where this This is actually car, yeah, seven, well se car 712. Yeah, old, do you remember that? Oh, heavens no, look at me. <laughs> yeah, no, you, know, you don't look that old. No, I'm not. <laughs> but I do. This. This picture was that's, outside. That's this picture was outside of Paris. I can't see either. Nineteen forty-eight. Yeah. We used to get sorry. Can you pass that around? We yeah. We used to get sorry out of that old right here. My yeah, mother wrote it. 18, I tried to get her to come today. Nineteen forty-eight, guys. Okay. Nineteen This one. Night. That's that's when that picture was taken. Nineteen forty-eight. There's a depot in Paris. Like I said, this would be where, in the proximity of the, where the old Casey store was at, which would be west of the. I think so, I don't know, it's the police buildings there now, whatever. Russ, where did this picture come from that you are that you had? Uh, Ron Sims in Des Moines. You there know. you go. Yeah, I got a bunch of pictures from him. Ron, yeah, see, I'm friends with Ron. And okay. Then I got a lot of the information from uh, him. From, from Ron. Ron is Ron is a he, he knows everything about yeah. about these. This <laughs> picture is taken at the uh, south west of the police station. The depot is at the... Is this a different depot that is up there across from the old Stokely building? Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. This, I mean, yeah, this this was obviously no Casey store, but in that, right. in the, that, gen, that general vicinity is where this was at. And this is where the turnaround was at. I mean, as far as where they turn around as well. Was, was part of that depot used by that Oliver implement dealer that was there after? Couldn't tell you. Okay. Couldn't tell you. That'd be another picture of Perry. It's got Perry as a destination. Might be that 1712 again. So what they're just like one driver? Yep. And what were their qualifications? Uh, Good, good question. I, I don't know whether they had to have a take the safety instructions or what they. You can see that one has a snow plow on the front. Oh, down here. Those are actual. We had actual tickets from. I don't know. I can't remember where I got them from. From might have been from Ron Sims. The top there's a, a ticket. Is he still alive? I think so. Okay. The last that I know, I haven't been to his house a couple a couple years. But if you want to know anything about railroads in Iowa, he's the guy. Well, see, we might have that that picture there is a special what they call a special car. Yeah. 
And they had those for like like state fair state fair time or somebody wanted to they were painted they were painted a different color, had different names on them, had an observation where people could sit and stand. But you had to pay you had to pay money. I mean you had to pay extra money in order to uh, to do that. So do any of the cars exist? Um, there are some cars. I mean, they have a car up in Boone. That at the the scenic uh, whatever that railroad's called up there. I knew they had there. They do have some in Mount Pleasant. At the old Threshers thing, they run a they run an interurban car or, or electric streetcar, which will be very similar to that. But you can see on this one, there is on the front. There's a mm -hmm. place where you can stand outside, and actually you can kind of see the where you can probably hang on. To, to something in that in that case, um, the the name of this was the Des Moines and Central Iowa Railroad is what they called it, and despite all the early success, uh, cars, trucks, paved roads spelled the doom of the railroad, and gradually cars were withdrawn until there was only one each way per day. Okay, and finally was discontinued in night in September of 1949. So, the cars, good, better roads, all that, you know, public transportation, uh, the train, the steam powered and the diesel powered and all that lasted a little bit longer than that. Unfortunately, and I don't understand, I, I do understand Americans, they want their own car, they want to be able to drive when they want to, how long they want to, this and that. Uh, we're the only major country in the world that does not have a high-speed trains. Oh, they do on the East Coast, I take that back. But as far as being able to travel places in the United States, it's Amtrak. I don't know how safe Amtrak is after hearing about all these accidents here lately. Uh, but my, I guess my point is I'd never see it in my lifetime. I'm, I'm sure I won't uh, see where uh, people are going to go back to, or the government. You know, we, we can't even get a, a, a train bill across Iowa. I mean, that was proposed and Nobody wants to do it unless private companies want to put the money out. The state doesn't want to subsidize it. The federal government said that they would help, but I, I think it'd be great. I would love that, where you could jump in a high school 150 miles an hour. Uh, that'd be fantastic, but uh, I probably would do that and let, let my car sit. But uh, for convenience, I guess that's the reason why. But, but anyway, uh, the last passenger train was 1940, and then the 49, they was sold to to Eastern Interest, a man by the name of Murray Salzburg bought it out and they continued to run it from the freight end of it where they run freight trains on it. But uh, business continued to dwindle and, and finally December 14th, 1953, that was when the last train was run on that, that particular track. So, but anyway, that's kind of a quick story. Not so quick story <laughs> about, about the interurban. But anyway, you guys have any other questions? You guys have questions that you know some of them I'm not going to be able to answer probably. Any records exist? I mean, do do we know what its peak, what re daily readership, uh, ridership was? Or um, I've never seen that. No, that's that's yeah. I don't know that for sure. I know at its peak. I mean, when it first started, I know there were a lot of people that did that wrote it. You said six thousand on opening day. Uh, there were 600 people that, that basically rode the train from Des Moines to Perry. 600. 600 people that rode the train from Perry. A lot of important people, or so-called important people, you know, Henry Wallace being one of them. But, you know, people were excited about it because it was a, it was a direct route to Des Moines. I mean, you didn't, I mean, you didn't have to, you know, you could get on, you could get on the Milwaukee or you could get on the other one, the, and, and you could probably ride to Des Moines, but it might, it might take you longer. Or it, I don't know, but more convenient, I think, is the whole thing. I mean, it was going to help. It was going to help Perry. The, the Perry businessmen thought it was going to help them to get people to come to Perry. Whether it did or not, I don't know. Other questions you want to ask me about this? I'm kind of curious about. I've heard a few of the stories, the connection that people have to it, a parent that wrote it, or anybody willing to share their connection to the railroad. Urban. Larry Franham's wife's grandfather, grandfather was a was a motorman. Yeah, on the one that 
On the Annie Urban. On the Annie Urban, it went to uh, by the park. Right. Oh, was Larry? So what did he yeah. do? He was a motorman. Uh -huh. He drove Marie's it. Two, Marie's, 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 So you, well, Hutt. So do you know what qualifications? Somebody was asking about qualifications to be a an operator. I don't know. Okay. I don't be able to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that was comforting. Yeah. Well, once from Perry, the Perry Des Moines, uh, my mother wrote uh, wrote that one. From Perry Des Moines. Yeah, and my sister. They used to walk down half mile from the house and get on. Cool. Like I said, I've talked to a lot, a lot of people in the assisted living and nursing and said that the, at one time or another they rode, like I said, they called it the galloping goose, but they, yeah. It's cool. Uh, is it 35 to 40 miles an hour? Yep. Was it, were freight trains about the same? Probably. Uh, the circus barn is still standing, yes. but it's fallen in. Yes. The uh, old one. Yes. I pulled it, I tied it back together. We're, we're getting it back in shape. Uh, up on top of the hill? No, the red one. Yeah. The, Got the so new roof on the it. The one of uh, where Gary lived. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So have you... Have it's you, pretty neat, too. Have you, lo have you looked into, like, the Yankee Robinson and the... Just visiting with the... The, the Robbins yeah, Brothers, I mean, the Robbins yeah. Brothers Circus. It's interesting. I mean, it's interesting stuff. I mean, the, I, I've done more on the Ort, like the Ortons. Yep. In the, in the Dallas Center. I mean, I got a, I got a whole lot of stuff on the Ortons. I don't have so much on them. Ortonville. Ortonville was yeah. <laughs> Hiram Hiram Orton. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he was the guy that. But I was just going to say, you know, you're talking about trains and fast. You know, the Milwaukee line had a train they called the Hiawatha. You guys yeah. heard about the Hiawatha? I remember the Hiawatha. <laughs> the Hiawatha was a high. It was a high-speed steam engine train that. 120 miles an hour, they could reach speeds 120 miles an hour with it. Wow. wow. Yeah, we got, we got pictures of it. Like if you ever go to the Dawson Depot, there's a there's a mural up of the Hiawatha that I, that actually the city of Dawson paid for it, but I had it made when I was working for Dallas County that, of that and a story about the Hiawatha. But you know, we, no, this this thing wasn't gonna make that kind of speed, but they're, they're, the Milwaukee, that there they're were high speed trains. What did you say you had a picture of the Hiawatha? Yep. A real picture or a painting? A real picture. Really? A picture over there. It's still hanging over there, though. Isn't in it? Dawson? Oh, yeah. yeah. We oh, worked yeah. at the I mean, elevator there's... over there. That's a neat depot. Yeah. That's worth the trip, too. Is that picture in the depot, Dawson? Yes. Yep. Yes. It's up, it's up above on the, as you walk into the depot, it's up above there. But I had it, I had it enlarged to a mural size. And then I have a story underneath it. There's a story about the high water. And that was a passenger. That was a passenger train, yes. Uh, I was, uh, just comment, uh, I was a kid uh, back in the, be the late 40s, and the Hiawatha was still running, and you could almost set your clock by it in the afternoon. It'd go through about 3 or 3.30, town here, and you could always hear it <laughs> go through. You knew the Hiawatha had gone through town, and, yeah. The same, the, I, I, can, I mean, growing up in Dexter, we could set our clock by the rocket, the, the Rock Island rocket. That was yeah. a high, I mean, it was like 90 miles. It, was, it wasn't, uh, it, it might have reached 100, but I mean, at five minutes to one, it was coming through. Yeah. I mean, we'd be sitting in class in school in Dexter, and you'd hear, the, hear it coming through. And then at night, it always came through at five minutes to nine, going back west. Yeah. And you could set, you could just about set your clock by it, so. Can I make another comment? Go. Cool. <laughs> um, the uh, and then I this was in the early 40s. Uh, we lived on the south southeast corner of town, last house about maybe half a mile from the inner urban track. But I was small then, and um, uh, I would see this thing come into going north, and evidently it would go up to the elevator, up the elevator or the depot, and I imagined it dead end. There and then just back back yeah. out, because I imagine you could reverse the electric yeah. motors. And uh, but I at that time I have no idea what it was, where it was going, or where it was coming from. And then the other comment I had at night, when it would come into town, we were close enough you could see you could follow the track of the the inner urban, 
uh, by the sparks. Oh. <laughs> whenever it hit a, a pole, yeah. evidently. Yep, yep. Yeah. Cool. Connector. Yeah. Cool. And you could just see it disappear out into the country. But you didn't think anything about it at the time. It's like, it's just another train? It was just part of living. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, but That's I was so cool. small, I had no idea what That's it was cool. or where it was going or what it was doing. Cool. So yeah. do you know any accidents or anything that ever happened? Uh, I really haven't, no, I really haven't <laughs> seen where they derailed or, or anything like that. So, but uh, I don't know, the, the, the newspaper articles, and again, I've got a few copies of it if you're interested in seeing them, but it's interesting how the, the Perry Chief tracked all this and they, they were predicting that it was going to get into Perry like, first it was July of 1906 and then they moved it back to, well, it's going to be August now and it's going to be September now and, and I don't know what kind of problems, labor problems or what was going on, but then finally in November it finally made it to Perry, but it took, it took a lot longer than what they really anticipated. So. But it, when they built the interchange for Highway 17 and 141, they borrowed dirt from up there on the hill and they kept digging up bones. And circus that's where bones? It's circus bones. Oh. Animals? Yeah. Hmm. I know that with, with the Orton Circus, there was a lady that, again, talking about a different thing, but, but in the Orton, supposedly there was elephant buried on Orton property too. Well, there's one of these assisted livings that there was an Orton that lived there. Florence was her name. wasn't Orton at that time. But anyway, I was talking to her, and she, uh, it was great talking to her. She gave me all kinds of stuff about, you know, she, she actually performed in the circus and this and that. But that was one of the questions that I asked, I asked Florence. I said, is there an elephant buried on the original Orton place? And she looked at me and she said, well, I don't think there's an elephant. But she said, there might be a camel. <laughs> I said, okay, close, <laughs> close. But she said, yeah, I think there might be a camel buried there, but I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any elephants that are buried there. But yeah, but, you know. another story of Dallas County. I mean, like I said, the, Dallas County is full of history, and it's uh, I was like, it's telling the librarian that you know I had probably 25 programs that I've done about Dallas County when I was working there, and you know, I enjoy every one of them and relating every one of them and. The Santa Urban just well, there's a know, book out about too. Dallas County. It just hasn't been too long ago. Yeah. Well, I yeah, I helped Darcy with that book. Doherty? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good book. Yeah. A lot of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Came from me. I yeah. just I just put it that way. <laughs> so you're bragging? No. <laughs> no, that was that was a really good book. I got. No, it. I I I'm in the process of putting all my my stories together. When are you gonna, when are you gonna have a body in Clyde one? Bonnie and Clyde program. Because you showed us, you showed us some guns over there, my brother and I. That Mac. Oh, you can. That uh, uh, B A R. The Browning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You let I, us hold that thing. And you <laughs> see you know if it's from Bonnie and Clyde or not. But you know that that gun that day that actually came from Fort Dodge. I the B A R. The B A R did, and, and ended up at the D C I. I. Well, when I was working for Dallas County, it wasn't so bad because I could go down there and borrow guns. And when I when I lost when they terminated me up there, the guy that I know down there continued to give me the guns. I mean, if I called him up and said I need this for a program, he'd say, Yeah, come on down. And then the last time I went down there, he says, uh, You aren't working for Dallas County anymore, are you? And he said, No. And he said, Well, he said that was kind of your, I don't know, protection or cover or whatever because you were a, a county worker or whatever. And since you're a civilian now. You know, I'll, I'll loan you the guns. I said, that's no problem. I said, I trust you and so on. And he said, uh, but, he said, if a law enforcement officer stops you, right? he says, you're, you're in big time crap. <laughs> because you're carrying a machine gun. I, I had the Thompson, had a Thompson submachine gun and a Browning automatic rifle in the back of my pickup. And it's like, they stop you. He said, you're going to be in trouble for having that. And then, my boss is going to call me in and say, you know, why'd you loan those guns out? He said, I'll loan them to you because I trust you and, and so on. I haven't been back down, but, you know, that Browning came from Fort Dodge. What's your story on it? What was it? Well, actually, when I was working at Dallas County, I called the people at Fort Dodge. I called the police chief who had been up there since, like, 1980. And that gun went to the DCI, like, in the late 80s or something. 
And I asked him about it, and I said, what do you know about it? And he said, I don't know any, one thing about it. But the thing that makes it interesting is Bonnie and Clyde were in Fort Dodge. Yeah. And they robbed a few things there, but I can't imagine them dropping a brownie. But it's possible. But, you know, a brownie and automatic rifle for you guys, I, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Really. That's what Clyde Burrow loved. 30-06 shells, 20-shot clip, full automatic, two and a half seconds. Two and a half seconds, you have 20 shots off. It's mm -hmm. a heck of a gun. Plus, no law officer had anything like that. He had a revolver that shot 38 caliber. <laughs> or maybe, maybe maybe 32 caliber or whatever. I mean, it was no match. I mean, if he got in a gun battle, Clyde was going to win. But didn't the cops run over there, Dexter, didn't they, when, when um, Clyde, whoever it was, out by the fire stairs? It depends on who you talk to. <laughs> it depends it depends on which story. There, I'm sure those, those people in that posse that day, which I found out two new members of the posse, the pits, the pits, uh, but I, I would imagine they were rather shocked when they found big tree limbs falling on their heads <laughs> this big. I mean, Clyde could have killed them, but he shot above them, you know, all these branches landing on them. I, I'm thinking, I bet they weren't so confident after them, you know, seeing that, but give them credit, they got up and shot Clyde three times, and Bonnie three times, and W.D. Jones three times, and I mean, it was, uh, but they got away. Yeah, I've heard the story from the fellers, Larry and Marvell. Marvell, Marvell, part of my program is about Marvell. Because he, he knew a lot about that. Mar yeah, Marvell was there, so yeah, yeah, he did. Oh, really? Marvell was there. At the park? No, he was there when he got he got taken captive by Clyde Burrow. He was on their farm where Yeah, where it's, on his right. dad's, it's on his dad's farm. Yeah. Yeah, Marvell was 19 years old. Expo Park is worth going down and reading the history on the science that they have there. We got a mark. Yeah, we have a mark there now. Talks about Dex. Well, thank you so much for coming, Rod. Yes. Anything else? I, thanks a lot. I appreciate you coming out on a snowy day. Um, I think maybe she's going to have you back maybe next month to do something about ghost tampons. Yeah. ghost tampons or something. Maybe possibly. They're wanting body and Clyde. Oh, they want you want body? I mean, yeah, oh yeah, that's fun.